Greetings and welcome back to Fun with Dash Cams. Today I'm going to cover a very unique feature on a camera that I purchased a while back. It's been almost a year, but I finally got around to making a video to discuss it. In this case, it is a very unique feature, very, very specific to only one product line and a handful of cameras that I've ever seen. And this one came down for about $120 at the time I purchased from GearBest. And so I figured I'd give it a whirl and try it out, and I was actually rather impressed. Uh, we will cover that specific camera. This is not a review of that camera. It'll just mention it. I'll show it to you. Mainly it's a practical example of using OBD or onboard diagnostics data uh, with a dash cam uh, to do various and sundry things. So that's why I put this under special features and applications. So uh, what is OBD? Well, uh, of, of course, like I said, it's OBD means onboard diagnostics. Uh, for these particular cameras, uh, one is usually an external interface, the other is part of the power cable, and you can also get these power cables to power general uh, dash cams as long as the interface matches. Um, is uh, th Their particular standard is the OBD-2. It's a very particular interface, looks similar to an old Centronix. Uh, you will find it in many, many vehicles made after the uh, mid to late 1990s. So it is a worldwide standard. You should find it on American cars, uh, cars made in South America, Asia, and Europe. There may be some other oddball vehicles that through the early 2000s may not have it, but as a general rule, it's uh, pretty standard on most uh, passenger vehicles and a lot of commercial vehicles. It's what they will use to tap into your vehicle and when they're doing emissions tests to pull up RPM, uh, the oxygen sensor data, that's how they're testing it. It's also what your mechanic would be using. In fact, that's its original intent. Uh, the OBD port is what a mechanic will plug in a diagnostic computer to or you can plug in a code scanner to. Similar to like the old ECC4s like I used to have on my uh, old Ford uh, Escort back in the 90s. It was a 2000, or excuse me, in the early 2000s, it was a, a 2000 model. And it basically, it was supplanted by this new type of interface, talks to the computer, part of the data bus of a integrated vehicle, and pulls telematic data. And what do I mean by telematic data? Well, that's like here, you may have error codes and status codes. Um, those error codes will be like, hey, the oxygen sensor is out of sync or out of whack. Um, I'm misfiring on one cylinder. Um, uh, I have a valve that's opening or closing at the wrong time. Timing is sensed as off. You know, it'll, it'll give you different error codes. Well, it also gives you status codes. Uh, it'll feed you information about where a certain sensor is, what it's detecting, what is the concentration of oxygen or CO2 or whatever that the uh, oxygen sensor is detecting um, to work with the catalytic converter so it can change the fuel mixture a little bit, the air fuel mixture a little bit and make the engine run more effectively or you can program the computer to tell the uh, injection system hey uh, I want to mix a little bit more fuel to provide more power so it's utilized uh, to not only read information out of the CAM bus that's in most modern vehicles, anything, like I said, made into the 2000s, late 90s and into the 2000s. Um, but it also allows you maybe to uh, reprogram it a little bit. It's what your mechanics will use, like I said, to read a bunch of stuff from and to try to figure out what's going on based on the error codes and based on the status codes to see how sensors are uh, working or is a solenoid cl opening and closing. Other information that it's uh, that you will use to read off of the CAM bus is things like speed, distance, RPMs, throttle, steering wheel angle, the steering wheel angle, as in do you have it turned left or right, and how much, uh, how far, how hard you're pushing down the accelerator, the ex uh, and uh, what the engine temp. And there's basically 11 to 13 primary. Uh, worldwide standard codes that all manufacturers will use. However, there are many additional codes that are specific to manufacturers. They don't release them. And so that's something we'll talk about in a second is, you know, only certain information can be captured on uh, an OBD2 interface that is relevant to the camera. You know, all these different engine codes, that they don't matter. Um, it only needs to know the basic things relevant for your driving. Do you have your turn signal on or off? Uh, what are the RPMs of the engine? Uh, are you throttling hard or are you not really applying uh, the accelerator at all, you know? And uh, what's interesting is this information is actually captured. The last 10 to 30 seconds is actually captured in an accident recorder. 
um, they go by different names but they're otherwise known as the black box in your vehicle and most modern vehicles have them a lot of imports have them by default in the US not every car has them uh, but many many of the more recent models do in fact I believe after 2013 it was to be mandated for all new vehicles sold in the US so in order to have that black box it has to be able to tie to a bus in this case a cam bus and it will then capture that information the same information that the camera would be capturing and recording alongside the video well this accident uh, recorder this uh, black box for the vehicle will be set off by usually the activation of the airbags and it will capture and preserve in a non-volatile format that will survive fires and impacts and everything a you know 10 to 10, 15, 30 seconds, depending upon the manufacturer. So talking about OBD2 and what are the, what's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, the good is you have additional data like speed and RPMs, whereas before, you know, we may have just had the video and the timestamp, or with a GPS receiver, we may actually do a burn-in, do an overlay, and get GPS information for location, um, inst you know, and then it will compute speed. Well, the GPS it may be cloudy, um, you may be going up or down hill, you know, so the GPS is not necessarily re uh, representing accurate, it's, it's a very good approximate of your actual speed and usually within one tenth of one mile an hour, um, but this is actually pulling what the car is actually traveling as it sees it. So what's on the speedometer is what would then be recorded from the OBD interface because that's as far as the car knows, that's what, that's how fast it's going. Most cars nowadays, the speedometer that little dial on the dash isn't actually a true speedometer anymore. It doesn't have a cable that goes down into the transmission or somewhere on the engine. It's actually just a it's a readout device. It's an out it's an output device. It's just a little motor that then responds across a load spring based upon how what input it's receiving from the computer in the car. So you can actually program a car to tell you that you're going slower or faster than you actually are. And that there's sometimes people talk about legislation or conspiracy theories that um, all all speedometers report that you're 11 miles an hour slower than you actually are. Well, that's a bunch of hooey. It's how fast the computer in the car thinks you're going. It outputs that to the speedometer. Same with the RPMs. Those are not physical cables plugged into the transmission or the engine anymore. Same with the odometer. It's again, it's reading a uh, sensor, usually a little magnetic sensor or a piece of a sensor off of the transmission or the flywheel. So this same data uh, that's going to be recorded in the accident recorder can then be used to reconstruct an accident. So it's the same kind of data, it's just you're recording it as it's being passed down the CAN bus and that's captured into your video stream into your camera or captured on a data file that's being saved alongside your video. Another thing nice about the uh, OBD interface is that it actually provides 5 volts, 12 volts of power. And that sounds familiar because that's what we need to run a dash cam. And there are aftermarket cables that will plug into an OBD and actually provide you a way to do a quote unquote permanent cabling uh, job, a permanent wire um, for power without splicing. And if the camera supports it, because the OBD is tied to the CAN bus and the engine, it'll report when the car is actually in park or when the engine is turned off, and then the camera will know to go into parking mode. So, uh, whereas before it had to use a, you had to splice in and maybe connect a cable somewhere or you know have a special module that's connected to something in a, uh, that then wires into your uh, fuse box. Instead this plugs right in and it knows immediately is your car on or off. And uh, I'll show you an example of that in the little model that I have, the bad. It's, it's really necessary. This may be more information than you need. Maybe you don't want people to know your engine's RPM. Maybe you don't need to know. I mean it's it may just be superfluous. It's really it's it's an interesting application. It's kind of neat and I can see that certain people that, ha that drive for a living they may want to capture this information. Uh, or Maybe they have a pastime of driving at the track. They want to capture this information, so I can see that. But you know, day-to-day -day driving probably not. Probably ninety-nine percent of us won't matter. Um, another thing is it takes up the ODB interface. So if you bring your car to the mechanic, well, the o the OBD uh, has this plug on it. They can't just plug right in, so they're going to have to unplug it. So you run the risk of you know forgetting to plug it back in. So your camera is not recording, and if an accident happens, well, then it was just a nice piece of furniture on your dash and nothing more. 
Um, another thing that I've read in the past is some people have suggested it might cause damage. Um, don't really know it's pulling data out, but there's always the possibility if the camera wigs out and suddenly shorts out, it could potentially short out the OBD interface. Um, I suspect that the camera will brick itself and die before that would happen, but there's always the possibility because the camera is drawing power from the interface. And this would also apply to your OBD uh, to Bluetooth uh, dongles that people plug in to record, like using the Caro app on your iPhone or, or your uh, Google device. Um, it'll be able to pull that via Bluetooth and then be able to incorporate that into a data file or to record uh, your performance of your engine as you're driving. Um, what's the not so ugly? Well, I mean, if anything, it's, you know, better to have uh, more than less, you know, it's additional data to augment your video. And I use an example that, you know, are you perhaps a race car driver? Do you like to do uh, uh, racing on a, tra on a local track? You have a little rice rocket or a beer burner or something like that. Slap a, car a dash cam in there, you have a uh, camera video, you know. You don't necessarily have to dedicate an action camera, but you could. But with OBD data, you know, it would also provide you interesting stuff like, you know, when you're shifting, when you're not, you know, when you're riding your brake through a turn, what's your RPM versus what gear you're in. I mean, that, that's interesting stuff you might want to capture. And that, so that's where OBD might be interesting for people. Uh, for most dash cam applications, it's really just going to be to augment what's already there on a standard uh, full, full HD with 30 frames a second. It's not really going to be action camera with specialized uh, in, uh, interfaces for uh, race driving. Um, so what, what else might it be? It might be additional data to dispute an accident. Like someone may say, oh, well, he suddenly accelerated right before. Well, you have the video. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but with OBD data, just like with an accident recorder, um, you know, the data is there. It could be accessed. And you could use it to show, no, in fact, uh, they were not accelerating, they were coasting, uh, they were not going faster, they were going slower, or, or, you know, here's the RPMs of the engine, there's no way that you could be in that gear going that fast because the engine would have blown up, or because the engine would have stalled, or whatever. I mean, I don't know. You know, you get a good lawyer that can craft an interesting argument with what you give them. But it's just additional data. So, going on to OBD, you know, here's a little description, of course, Wikipedia talks about onboard diagnostics, many devices have it, and we're in particular talking about OBD2. So OBD2 was released uh, back in the 90s. Uh, let's just go back and we can talk about, you know, that GM and other manufacturers had different standards, but I want to show right here, 1996. Uh, so for the US, it's mandatory. It's also used for your emissions tests and everything else. That's where Volkswagen fudged the numbers a little bit because they programmed their cars here a couple years ago, certain models, to see that if it detected that an OBD, uh, uh, OBD cable was plugged into the OBD sensor, I mean in the OBD uh, port, then it would automatically fudge the numbers to give better uh, mileage, better emissions, um, numbers than uh, if, if it had, they had not finagled with it. And that's how they found out, you know, because there was a little bit of discrepancy that people discovered about it. That's how they eventually uh, got caught by the Federal Trade Commission and were required to pay a substantial fine because their vehicles were not, and because uh, they were basically invalidating emissions uh, tests. In some states like California, that's very important. Other states uh, have it tied to your uh, registration like we do here in Texas. So, and uh, other countries have adopted uh, the OBD standard uh, to be used in vehicles, or they have a similar. Um, here's like the EOBD, the European OBD, which is related. Um, in North America, it's OBD2, OBD3, you know, a different, whatever standard comes after the OBD2 um, will use a same or similar connector, but it would have to be used by anybody that uses this application. So they actually have a website dedicated to the standard. And it get, it's very nice because it goes through, talks about what is OBD, what does it mean to you, what is about your car, because it's a part of your car. For the camera's per, uh, sake, uh, we need to know what it looks like. And uh, they have a nice little picture here. Thought they did. Well, anyways, we'll just use the wiki article. So this plug right here, increase that a little bit. 
So the plug usually found uh, underside near where the driver is or in the fuse box in the passenger compartment. Um, this little interface has, will have a corresponding cable that will plug into it and, and based on the pinout it will read codes and it can actually then control the engine and pass it commands and pass it certain status codes to tell it to do things like to run a self test or um, activate a certain solenoid or to reprogram the car like uh, to tell the computer hey I want to give you a different profile and I want to make you uh, use more power when, uh, when accelerating or use you know thin out the mixture you know when someone is going down a hill if it senses that they're letting off the accelerator to increase efficiency so not only can data come out but data can go back in for our application we're just worried about reading data from so we're only going to use a couple of those pins and here's where you can see the pin pin out and they use different things different manufacturers will also use different pins to do other things but there's a certain basic set that all manufacturers using OBD2 will use in a certain number usually between 11 and 13 um, basic pieces of information that is standard across all of them because it's part of the OBD2 standard and all the codes that are added after that are vendor specific so only dealerships would have that or only certain uh, ASC techs would uh, be worried about that based upon if it's a big rig or heavy machinery or whatever so we've talked about OBD2 we've talked uh, about the interface itself so this is the camera that I got and I wanted to show this that this this particular camera was popular about two or three years ago it was actually sold by ePrance first and then um, but it was marketed mainly under the GT880S um, sold at GearBest and as you can see by GearBest uh, when I bought it, it was almost 120 even with the with the uh, discount uh, you'll also notice that it's the same camera <laughs> as the Kobe the Kobe uh, OBD camera uh, and this actually sells at a, at, a, at a very similar price to what it's been for the last year or so. And at one point, uh, this company, Wasp, actually did market it. I don't believe they do it anymore. It's not in their product list. However, it was, because if you'll notice, the interface here is the same as the one that I have, which mine is the Shadow Tech. And this looks mysteriously like the Kobe which the interface is very similar. In fact, I think that might almost might be the same picture. Well, not. Um, but it's very much the same as the shadow that I have. They just replace the GPS for and some of this other stuff for it. But I believe this, the sh uh, I believe Shadow Tech is actually the company that uh, originally marketed it. I don't know who actually makes it. So here's another interesting application of OBD. It's uh, Lucas. They're the only. They're they actually sell an entire line of cameras, single and dual lens, high definition with all the bells and whistles. And one of the things they offer for certain models is an external uh, OBD interface not to power the camera but to pull OBD data and, and I thought this was real interesting because if you watch this video right here I'm gonna turn the audio off you notice down here on the bottom of the screen that you have your RPMs you have your speed you have uh, distance traveled you have uh, probably percent of engine load or throttle and it shows where, how hard they're pushing the accelerator shows what gear they're in uh, whether they sport eco mode or not, uh, voltage fr uh, from the bus to the camera, and all that kind of stuff. What's what's the current voltage going to the battery is really what that is. So it's uh, very interesting. Um, and certain cameras, because like I said, codes vary. Um, the Lucas actually does support, like you see, they're hitting their brakes, so it does support certain uh, makes, uh, vehicle manufacturer makes and models. It sh it'll say, hey, he's hitting the brakes now, and that would be in the accident recorder as well. So this would actually show, hey, I was going toward this, I was actually slowing down, not speeding up, can't make the argument. I have the video and also shows that the OBD data backs it up, that I was hitting the, hitting the brakes, I was not accelerating, I was decelerating. You know, that, that's where you can make the case for that. So looking at the camera, as you can see, it is uh, basically very similar in size to a, a G1W. So it's pretty much a, very much a standard camera. In fact, it has the same uh, Novatech uh, 96650 processor. Um, it has the same AR0330 sensor that I believe the old uh, um, 0801 had. So it's uh, kind of a hybrid, but it's the guts primarily are like a G1W. In fact, the buttons are very much the same. Same place for the SD card for the HDMI. Same place for the SD card. Um, and even you know the power button everything 
Um, what's interesting though is right here is we have our power and that's where the cable comes in. As you can see it's micro U it's mini USB and it uses OBD. And on the sensor it actually has, a, you probably can't see that, but it has a switch on there and it's all written in Chinese but it says monitor mode, normal mode. So monitor mode, normal mode for parking monitor and normal mode. What does that mean? Well that switch tells the camera to support the parking mode feature. So if I flip that on and, my, and I turn my car off, the camera actually stays running. It's still pulling power because the bus is actually still active. So it does pull a trickle charge, keeps the camera active, keeps it powered up, and uh, if somebody walks by it will trip off motion sensing in the field of view and it will record a small little burst of clips. So they're like one, cl one second a clip. One clip. It's like one frame a second. In normal mode it'll turn itself on and off just like normal. So that's the main reason but it also uh, is interesting because it supports other stuff uh, primarily the uh, the data. So here's an example from this particular camera of the data. So you look in up here in the top left you'll see it's voltage on the bus to the battery, the current RPMs, um, the fact that I'm going nine miles an hour according to what the car is computing, um, these, uh, then it's uh, the throttle, it's, uh, well, engine load, throttle position, because I was accelerating, uh, engine temperature, 84 degrees Celsius, uh, the current uh, estimated capacity from the, the trip computer function of uh, gasoline still left, and then it has a few others. Um, it's like number of, number of times you uh, it encountered an error, uh, any kind of OBD codes it may find. This is like OBD code here. This is distance traveled that is computer you've traveled and that goes to the odometer reading uh, for this trip. Um, it has number of times that you made hard stops and uh, I'm not sure this other number it always changes so I never quite was sure what it was it just goes. I think it's uh, it detects a sudden impact so basically like an accelerometer within the car itself um, but it, uh, you can look it up it's the GT880S and that's what all those are. Now what's also nice about the camera is the fact as you saw that it's also got the GPS so that's why I wanted to bring that up is the GPS here is receiving it's active it refreshes like one or two seconds one or two times a second and uh, you'll see here when I play it let me mute that um, that I am getting live GPS data and it's being encoded so it's actually being encoded in the video uh, the video stream of the file not as a separate file um, as a log file um, I've got my date timestamp. Um, you'll notice the date is changing. And the one thing I thought was nice is that the speed here is not being computed. It's actually what is being reported on the OBD bus. So if you have certain applications where you need that to record that information, like I said, if you're driving on a track as an amateur driver, um, you're a long haul trucker and you want to record how your vehicle's doing and so you want to record or you're a company owner and you wish to record that as a true tachograph, you know, it's, uh, this would be a quick and dirty way to do it. Uh, put that in the vehicle and, you know, your drivers will just sit there and it, it protects them but it also reports back, you know, were they accelerating hard, were they not, how fast were they going and it's from the, the vehicle itself so you know, you can't, you can dispute the GPS a little bit, although it's hard to do that. You know, GPS is, especially on a day like today and in m most, most conditions is pretty good. Um, but the vehicle itself is reporting. So, you know, if, if you tell somebody, hey, tell your boss, hey, uh, I was only going 60. And he says, no, I have somebody that complained saying you were going 80. Well, here's your video and there's the speed and that's the speed from the vehicle. So you'd have to argue with you and the vehicle that, uh, you know, you were, uh, even though it says 60, that both of you were wrong. Well, the, since the vehicle doesn't care and it doesn't have any reason to lie about how fast it's going. So I, that's, I'm just trying to throw that out there. That's just some interesting uh, applications uh, of OBD. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was instructive. And I want to thank you very much for your time.